for putting uh, this series together. The idea with this is to look across the campus and especially tap into our uh, affiliated faculty members who are doing global uh, health work uh, but are not primarily based in GHS to uh, kind of broaden our uh, base of information and we're looking forward today uh, to a topic that's really obviously very important. Anyone who's traveled in resource limited settings know how um, we think about blood transfusion requirements, especially when there was a lot of concern about uh, getting HIV when it was a non-curable fatal disease. Now we still wouldn't want to get it from a blood transfusion, but, um, but the people that are most responsible for helping uh, improve the safety of blood products uh, globally, uh, not just for HIV, but for all the other issues, uh, are going to be kind of helping lead us through that today. Ed Murphy is a professor of laboratory medicine. Um, I'm trying to resist looking at the crib sheet that I have in front of me. Um, maybe medicine as well as lab medicine? Uh, no, FB, FB Biostat. FB Biostat, okay. Uh, but uh, based uh, primarily at the Blood Systems Research Institute for the people, uh, the old timers, it, it's what we used to call Irwin Blood Bank up on uh, Masonic and, and Geary, or near there. Um, and uh, Ed has uh, conducted a, a variety of, uh, of research projects, uh, I think maybe especially lately in South Africa. Um, but has worked, uh, I, I first ran into Ed when you were still working in Jamaica as a cancer epidemiologist, I think at the time, in the early part of the, uh, of the epidemic. Um, Liz Donegan, I think of is still active, and I think she's still here with us, uh, but has retired, uh, is back uh, at, a, at a small fraction, but has uh, also been really important uh, in thinking about blood safety um, uh, uh, globally as well as domestically. So. Um, Ed's going to start this off. Uh, I think the way we've been doing this is um, let them split the time. Uh, if you have questions as we go along, I think interrupt. Uh, if it gets to be too interrupted, uh, we might kind of ask to slow it down so we can get both, uh, both talks in the hour that we have. So Ed, you want to yeah. start this? And I think we're live streaming too, so... Um, Think of the camera over there. <laughs> okay, thanks, Paul. And uh, glad to see everybody, particularly a number of young faces, which will, you know, bodes well for the future of, of global health. So, um, I, and as Paul said, it's, it really is, I, I didn't start out as a blood banker. Um, uh, I actually uh, met Liz a number of years ago when I first came to UCSF. But um, I, as Paul said, I initially I'm trained as an internist and epidemiologist and came into blood banking really from the side because it really is an excellent laboratory for any of you considering doing research, particularly epidemiological studies. So, and I hope today to tell you a little bit about what we're doing, particularly in South Africa. So uh, with that, I'll get started. Um, so uh, my outline basically today, I'll be talking about uh, describing some work that we're doing under the REDS research contracts. Uh, you don't need to know what that means, but just for information, it's, uh, it's Recipient Epidemiology and Donor Surveillance um, Project, which is a, um, funded by the NHLBI, so it's the blood division of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. I'll talk a little bit about that, not much at all, but I'll go directly then into some of our studies in South Africa, which concern obstetric blood transfusion, um, and um, also a study where we're giving early HIV treatment. Um, and then uh, a very brief mention of some work um, in multiple countries in Africa doing quality control on uh, virologic testing. And then finally, I'm going to end up with uh, several slides on a research training program that we're doing which to help develop human capital in these countries where we're working. So um, oops, back a little bit. Um, so basically, um, moving to Red South Africa, um, this um, is a, uh, a project that we began, the funding started in 2011, and just prior to that we did a needs assessment to try to figure out what were the projects that were most important clinical research projects to the South African uh, National Blood Service, which is our partner. 
um, and I'll show you some slides in a minute, we'll show you the reach of Sandus. They collect blood for about 85% of the country, with the exception of the region around Cape Town. Uh, for political historical reasons, Cape Town has decided to remain separate from the National Blood Supply uh, Blood uh, Organization. Uh, what we decided then to do, based, REDS um, has, in the U.S., has gone on for 20 years. I won't go into that. We, that's a whole other topic. But um, uh, it, it, it works well by building databases because blood banks are very good because they collect computerized data on large numbers of people, which you can use for research studies. And then we, we're launching um, three clinical research projects, uh, basically looking at the effective HIV and obstetric blood transfusion, uh, a study uh, on uh, HIV, HPV incidence and risk factors, uh, and then a study on recruitment of low-risk blood donors. Um, and then there are a number of sort of spin-off laboratory studies. The other advantage of blood banks is that you collect blood samples every time a person comes in so that you have access to both data and biological specimens. So um, this is just an example of the uh, uh, it's actually an article that we now is in submission. It's basically looking at the first three years of data, and I guess I can show you on the thing here, three years of data from the database that we built, and this allows you to see, um, just broadly speaking, what is, and we look at um, first-time blood donors because they're more representative of the general population because uh, a, a donor who's repeating, right, has been screened previously so we'll have lower prevalence. Um, so first-time blood donors have an overall uh, HIV prevalence of 1%. Um, now, if you can believe it, the number in the U.S. is down in the 1 per 10,000 range. Okay, so basically 100 times uh, larger prevalence of, of HIV in their first-time blood donors. And it increases with age, uh, twice as high in females, and, uh, and also much higher in the black population, as you all know from the, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they have similar types of um, recruitment. There, there's there's both self-selection and uh, and kind of active selection going on to select for healthier people. And uh, one other thing they do is if you kind of see at the numbers here, look at the huge numbers of uh, under 20 year olds. What their strategy basically at present to get low HIV risk people is to go into the high schools. Okay, because that's where the lower risk people are. So. And they're trying also, by doing that, I'm not going to talk today about the donor recruitment uh, project, but the, there's an imbalance in that the blood donors are predominantly still, um, there's an imbalance where, where the white population, which is only 9 or 10 percent of the country, gives uh, almost half of the blood supply. Um, and so uh, they're trying to work to reduce, to, to fix that, basically. So, um, okay, move on here. And, and this just shows geographically where the HIV is distributed. It's not super informative um, in that basically it says that it's, it's all over the place, uh, with the exception of the, the, these pink areas are higher prevalence compared to the white areas, and uh, the green area is lower prevalence. It just shows you that the high areas are Pomalanga, KwaZulu-Natal, et cetera, which, we, which fits well with the national data. So the, the point of this is that you can use blood donor data to approximate national uh, prevalence, albeit with a, you know, conversion factor to account for the selection bias that I talked about, the fact that probably the donors are something on the order of five times, ten times lower prevalence, perhaps, uh, maybe not quite that high. Okay, so uh, the first clinical study I'll talk about is the um, transfusion and pregnancy study, and this is a study which uh, the Sandus, the blood service, estimates that somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of their blood supply goes to obstetrics, which is really high. In this country, it's more like it's under 5 percent, 1 to 5 percent. So, um, and they feel that it's a big issue uh, it, in terms of because they nationally have on stock at any one point fewer than five days supply of blood. Okay, so there's kind of a real problem of supply, and they, anything they could do to reduce demand would be helpful. So we decided to study the reasons for risk factors for peripartum blood transfusion. And so what we did is to uh, design a really big case control study, um, which includes 1,200 cases which are transfused women and 2,400 non-transfused women 
all of whom are in the peripartum period, in other words, within 48 hours of delivery, before and after delivery. And the predictors that we're looking at are HIV status and CD4 count, uh, medical chart review for obstetric data, and then we do get blood samples for looking at various biological phenomena. So, and these are just to show the three locations. We're doing uh, four hospitals, four large hospitals in the three major cities of South Africa, uh, one hospital in Joburg, one in Durban, and two hospitals down in Cape Town. Um, this is the hospital in Johannesburg. I don't know if any of you may have been to Johannesburg or Soweto, but this is the outside of about, you know, several miles outside of Johannesburg. There's a large former township, which has now become a city of about a million people. And this is one of the largest hospitals in the world. I don't know what the bed count is, but it's in the thousands. It's, it, you know, not, doesn't surpass Chinese hospitals, but it's really a big old hospital. It used to be a military base and it's been converted into. And um, so that's the setting for this hospital. And just to give you an idea of the scale of the populations which were available to this, in the about year and a half or so of enrollment, uh, there were about, there were over 60,000 births. Um, so um, at the uh, Barra Hospital, the one I just showed you, had 30,000 of those, had fully half of those births. So there are literally 60 odd births per day. So it's, it's kind of a huge uh, institution. And uh, uh, the other point to make here is that the overall um, HIV prevalence is really high. I mean, it's basically uh, about a one third, uh, and I'll show you in a minute in the actual study, but this is denominator data on the on all of the women who came through. And the, the C-section rate is really high. It's uh, approaching 50%. But keep in mind that these are all referral hospitals, so this is, doesn't include primary birth clinics, which are run by nurse practitioners. And um, so then the uh, a little bit about the demographics, nothing too surprising. These are all mostly young women uh, in their 20s and 30s. Um, the black population is the great majority. Uh, they're, the, the colored in South Africa refers to individuals of mixed race, um, uh, and, uh, but represents kind of a distinct population group there in terms of the way they, they look at things. And HIV status, again, in our study group, in the cases and controls, was even higher than in, those, in the other part. And the, in, the, in the controls, about 28%. In the cases, about 34%. And so I won't go into all of the, you know, sort of bivariate data, but just skip to the punch, which is the final model. And surprising to us, a lot of the obstetric phenomena uh, or variables like um, uh, gravidity, number of pregnant, pr prior pregnancies, gestational age, things like that, did not predict the risk of transfusion. Um, clearly, if you had obstetric hemorrhage, which means the woman was bleeding, well, then it's really a no-brainer. You're going to have an odds ratio of about 75. You're going to be at much more risk of getting blood. But the other thing I think that is, and there's not much, too much you can do about that, but this is in something, this is the prenatal hemoglobin, okay? And um, you can see that uh, a lot of the women uh, have been coming in to deliver with, you know, with anemia. And so it basically, I think our main take-home message is that if you, you know, if you are anemic coming in and then you have some hemorrhage, you're much more likely to get transfused. So, um, makes sense. And likewise, being unbooked, that means a woman coming in without any prenatal care. And then finally, HIV status, um, despite controlling for these other risk factors, still remained. And we're not quite sure of the mechanism as to why that is, as to whether it's a biological phenomenon or there's still some treatment difference given to the HIV positive woman. I think any of those are inappropriate. Um, yeah, we looked at that, Paul, and the, um, uh, you mean specifically in the HIVs? Well, or in general, in, in general, the, are there, are there yeah. kind of causes or associations with transfusion that you could deal with by better training of the yeah. medical staff? We looked at that, the, the pre-transfusion hemoglobin, and Liz will know about this, it was about, on average, seven. So that's, you know, that's pretty good. It doesn't suggest there's a lot of inappropriate transfusion going on. So these were mostly women who really needed yeah. the blood situation. Yeah, I think about the control failure, but do you find um, there is a correlation between the transfer status and the 2010 year? Uh, yes, we did. 
Yeah, and I don't have that here, but in the pilot study, we clearly showed that the HIV positives had a hemoglobin of about a half a gram lower than the HIV negatives. So, yeah. Is there any indication about renal virus? Not in this aim, but we have a separate aim, which is looking at um, anemia in these women, and there we've, we're studying that. Yeah, it's, it's mostly it's iron deficiency anemia, and it's it's very prevalent. So. Anyway, that's that's kind of so. Switching gears, um, and we can come back to that later in questions if you want to. But the um, switching gears to HIV more directly. Um, I don't know if, how much the group has background in terms of HIV infection, but this is just to remind everyone of the so-called FIBIC stages. Some of us know uh, the originator of this name, uh, Ebi Fiebig, who is, uh, used to be in our Department of Lab Medicine until he retired a couple of years ago. Uh, really nice guy, and, uh, but helped develop with Mike Bush these stages of HIV. Suffice to say that, um, yeah, Fiebig stages one and two are the various early stages of HIV infection, which happen before you develop antibodies. So you just have RNA or virus, and then as soon as you develop antibody, you go into these other stages which have to do with what kind of antibody that you have. So the, all it, you, know, you need to know is that FIBIG, each, as the numbers go up, it gets later in the stage of HIV infection, okay, because your, your viral load goes up when your antibody develops, essentially. Um, now, because the South African Blood Bank does really uh, sophisticated testing uh, for uh, HIV, they, they do both standard serology or antibody tests, and they do nucleic acid testing, which is uh, a test for RNA. And they do those both in parallel on every donation. So um, that means that you can detect individuals who are, uh, on the one hand, only RNA positive um, and don't have antibodies. So that means they're in FIBIG 1 or 2. They're very early in the first two, three weeks of infection. And that's these cases here. Why is that important? It's because these people, if you didn't do the nucleic acid testing, they'd be missed, right? Yes, they're only coming up on the RNA test. In addition, these are people that are very, very early in HIV infection. And then there's elite controllers, which are people who have antibody but don't have any virus uh, or undetectable virus offhand. And that's another group of interest to the HIV world for studying. So. Um, anyway, that's the setting for what we're doing. We, just, we set up a study called MATHS, where you have the monitoring and acute treatment of HIV study, basically looking at FIBIC stage, seeing about the HIV reservoir, and then just showing that we can try to get these individuals very early in HIV into treatment. And so the study design is we're aiming for 75 of these acute HIV infections. Um, we're also going to have 25 uh, so-called recent HIV infections who are um, just have both uh, nucleic acid and antibody but have another antibody test which says that they're probably within the first three to five months of infection. And then finally we have a group of elite controllers um, and the first two groups we're going to start them and have started them on treatment very rapidly. So we get them in, get them on treatment, and then we're going to follow them for two years. And these are individuals, the acute HIVs, whom we think may be eligible for HIV cure studies later. Um, they may be actually able to be cured with the, some further intensification of treatment. There's a bunch of measurements. These subjects come in a lot, so it's a very burdensome study. This is, you know, about, you know, whatever, 13, 14 visits over the two years for the acutes. Um, this is our enrollment so far. Um, we are running at about 75%. That's what this yellow line is. This would be our target enrollment here. We're a little bit below what we had initially projected, but it's going okay. And we've currently enrolled about a third of our targeted um, acutes. Um, I should qualify this by saying that we're really only, we're aiming to enroll 75 to get 50 uh, with full data. Okay, so we're, and actually these 23 are, we're, we're, are, are people with full data. So it's really, we're almost halfway there. And then 11 of 20 elites, uh, there's a separate story. I can tell you about this though, that um, some of us know, but I'll tell you that, about that later. Some of these individuals we've learned are 
actually not elite controllers, but they came to donate blood, knowing they're HIV positive and taking ART, and were picked up as as Ill, false elite controllers. It's a real issue in terms of so we're dealing with that right now. Um, but the uh, FIBIG stages, basically at the time of uh, the donation, which is where we picked them up, they were all FIBIG 1 and 2. By the time we got them, there's been about 12 and a half days till we got them in the study. And uh, half of them are still you know, in FIBIG 1 or 2. The other half have drifted down to FIBIG stage 3. So, and that's when they start their ART. So generally speaking, uh, good results there. Um, this just shows you there um, the HIV viral loads on the uh, on the cases. We get a good rapid decline in viral load and good suppression. We've had a couple of people who have had some blips coming up, but um, you know it, due to various reasons. And but mostly those have been able to be, have been addressed. Um, this is the CD4 data shows sort of the opposite. Uh, they, some of them. One one gentleman came in uh, with a CD4 count of only 150, even though he was a hyperacute infection, and actually, um, you know, but his everyone's CD4 count comes up when they go on on therapy. So that's kind of the HIV study. Then shifting gears very quickly to our quality control study. Um, this is something we're doing in collaboration with Dr. Cyria Leperche in Paris. She's at the French uh, Blood Transfusion Agency. And uh, my colleague, Evan Block, who was an alumni of the master's program, but has now moved on to Johns Hopkins. Uh, we've, done, we've studied a, co a total of, um, uh, I forget how many, 30-odd countries now between two different studies. The study design is pretty simple. Um, the, we, we sign up laboratories at the blood banks in all these countries. Dr. Leperche makes a blinded panel of 25 samples, which contain some HIVs, some Hep Bs, some Hep Cs, and some negatives. And they're all blinded, so they don't know what it is. And then she sends it out, and the blood banks test, their, test the panel, and they send the results back to us in San Francisco, and we analyze the data. Um, and the results are a little bit disturbing in that um, this is the results for HIV sensitivity. You, while you can see that uh, two-thirds of the laboratories uh, got a 100% score, um, there's another third that, that has issues, uh, that you know has sensitivities that are dropping down to 70-80%, which is really not good at all. And uh, the CDC has um, seen this data and has now asked us to work with their PEPFAR program to try to repeat um, this, this study and, and try to come in with some remedial action uh, with the CDC partner. So uh, just to end up now, is I'll talk a little bit about our training program. Um, I think many of you have known about, or have heard about the TICKER program here at UCSF, which was started by Steve Hulley a number of years ago. Um, and what we've done is to kind of adapt that program and, uh, um, and elaborate a little bit on that, uh, realizing that these blood banks are full of ind smart individuals, uh, PhDs, MDs, who want to do research but don't have the ability or the haven't been initiated into research. And so that's what we're trying to do. And uh, so it's basically a, a pyramidal structure, inverted pyramid. We start with short courses, and then we have medium term inter internships in San Francisco, and then finish up with mini grants and mentoring. And um, the short-term courses are essentially taking the six-week ticker course, which uh, is given here in, in San Francisco. We've squeezed it into two weeks, and we give it in-country. Um, so basically, individuals, um, the, the aim is to provide a state-of-the-art review of blood bank research, and also, but mainly, to give them epidemiologic protocol design um, ability. And the target audience is, uh, as I said, young MDs, PhDs working in the blood, blood transfusion area. And we try to get a, a buy-in from the senior management that they will be able to do research once they finish this training. The curriculum is, um, consists of morning lectures, which uh, this follows pretty much the, the six-week course squeezed into two weeks. In the morning, they get lectures. In the afternoon, every trainee uh, brings a research question. And during the two weeks of the class, they actually write a protocol. 
So we work with them to write in the afternoon a uh, five or six page research protocol based on their own research question. So um, it's really a fun thing. I really enjoy doing that. And uh, we've had, uh, it's been going now about 10 years, a little over 10 years, 10, 12 years now. We've had a total of uh, 21 courses, I think, and um, two, over 200 alumni of this uh, short course. Um, so it's, and you know, as you can see, there's been a wide variety. We started out in Latin America, our colleagues down in Brazil, but more recently we've been focusing on uh, South Africa, and also you see Paris, France in here. Now we don't think that Paris has a problem, but, but that's uh, for Francophone Africa, it's easier to do things in Paris because all of the flight connections sort of go through there. So the course in Paris is for Francophone uh, African trainees. And uh, then medium term internships are here uh, in San Francisco. We bring people here for six week uh, trainings and uh, a number of them, they may do the ticker course uh, or they, in George Rutherford's, the ICAPS manuscript writing course, a number of them do that. Um, or take some of the courses in the epidemiology department. So, um, and then they also spend the afternoon working with us, uh, or you know, what are the off days working over at the uh, at BSRI with us. And then finally, the other one last part of it is we, when we on good years when we have money left over, we uh, we give out mini grants, which are done through kind of a just a regular process of offering small grants based on their um, protocol and their curriculum vitae. Um, so as I said, we've had uh, you know 21 short courses, uh, 236 trainees. We've had um, 15 trainees come for the medium term training in San Francisco. We've given out 26 mini grants, and I think to me the real metric is that there have been uh, about 80 publications co-authored by the alumni of this training course, which I think is the real and the enthusiasm that's generated. I think is. The hard thing is to keep up with the demand of on, ongoing mentoring because when the kind of the number grows, uh, having a couple of us here in San Francisco is, is hard to keep on top of that. Uh, and we've had a couple of people who've gone on to get grants, which is really the final goal. So I think just finally saying that we're, uh, uh, after five years, this partnership with um, South Africa has launched several high-impact uh, HIV studies um, and is really, you know, on track to be uh, successful and has built sort of a model uh, for what we'd like to do uh, in this kind of research. Um, and the other priority is building human capital that I talked about sort of towards the end. And we want to keep doing this. Um, funding for that training program has been challenging. Uh, we've put it together. Uh, we actually had a grant from CIFAR. Uh, we've had grants from uh, some of the transfusion societies, et cetera. But we're now trying to get a Fogarty, uh, a Fogarty grant to, to fund this. So, And then finally, um, the other thing that's gratifying is that SANBUS, the blood service, South African National Blood Service, has just announced that they are planning to develop their own R&D institute, which uh, essentially will be their own sort of research. And with several of the people that we've trained are now going to be the NIDAS for this new research institute. So it's kind of a cool thing that they can start to get their own funding. So uh, just to end up with um, acknowledgments of uh, you know my colleagues here at um, UCSF, particularly also Willie McFarland, who helped develop the short course with me back uh, when we started off in Brazil. Uh, a number of people at the South African uh, National Blood Service. And then, of course, our funding from the NHLBI for the, uh, for the RED study. So with that, I will uh, end up. And maybe any other questions that, we, that you have before we move on to Liz? In the meantime, we can show some yeah. nice pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, good. Good points. Um, 
we are we did build in some follow up of the babies to the case control study but we are having challenges in doing that because um, most of the women are not based at these hospitals they're referrals so they go back out to their community clinics and we've had trouble pulling together the data we're we're going to try and show something about that but it won't be it's not active follow up it's just seeing what what data we can gather from the system um, so we but the the other thing I didn't show though is that the we did gather data on the um, rollout of H of HIV therapy for these women and uh, whereas when we did our pilot study the coverage was maybe 70 percent or so it's now up well above 90 percent coverage so they are doing really well after you know uh, we all know the bad years in South Africa when the president was a denier of, uh, of HIV um, now they've really turned the corner and are doing very much on that um, and then uh, the other question was sickle cell yeah um, again not much uh, but yes with the immigrant growing immigrant population they are seeing more of that I wouldn't say that it constitutes a big portion of the blood supply in yeah. blood usage at this point though yeah I just wondered, <clears throat> this might be an excellent place for some of the masters or PhD students to uh, do research projects have you had any experience with we've had it we've had a couple yeah through Evan Block who you know is now moved on unfortunately to Johns Hopkins that other place on the East Coast <laughs> but um, uh, Evan uh, was is an alumni of the masters program and he sponsored a couple of interns um, who um, have uh, been through South Africa and also um, you know to to some of our francophone countries so yeah there's an opportunity for any of you wanting to work with us either in San Francisco or potentially in South Africa we have to be a little careful the, the blood bank uh, they're thin on a little thin on mentorship because the people are they're all operational busy people so we have to be a little careful there but okay great thanks Liz whoops <laughs>
to bleed people with Chagas disease in the mountains of Panama uh, to see if they still were actively infected. At those times, at that time, there were no EIA tests for Chagas disease that the blood banks now have. Um, when we went to jungle school, I was the only woman in the class, and I was assured that uh, these boa constrictors were not a problem. They showed us the flora and fauna of the jungle. I was a little bit reluctant, but uh, took the uh, snake and was totally unprepared for uh, the squeeze that it gives you. But you can see jo Dr. Johnson over there in the corner, uh, who was m my first uh, laboratory mentor. They gave us a pack of survival cards because they sometimes would drop us off by helicopter and not be able to pick us back up. So they were always a little bit afraid we'd be left in the jungle uh, and left to our own resources, which were very minimal. Uh, these cards were from uh, Vietnam. They told us what we could eat, what we couldn't eat, uh, how to get water, what to do, uh, until somebody found us. And their one rule was, you know, if you get lost in the jungle, just look for a river and follow the river. You will eventually get somewhere. So thank God that never happened. They also told, uh, uh, taught us how to, for a girl from California, it was just great. They uh, taught us how to use compasses, how to do an azimuth. They taught us how to repel, how to be extracted, from a helicopter on a rope and take patients with us. And then at the end of the course, they dumped us in the jungle and said, you know what, we'll meet you down the Chagas River and pick you, you, we'll spend the, you can spend the night in the jungle and then we'll take you through the Panama Canal uh, in a gunboat. This is Panama. Uh, you can see uh, Pan oh, Panama City. And uh, College of the Americas was up there in, by Cologne. And uh, then we did clinics uh, in the mountains of Panama, which is where the Chagas disease was, and down here in the jungle in uh, the Darien, which was right next to Colombia. A lot of the trips were by open helicopter over the jungle. Uh, which was lots of fun because your uh, legs could hang out the side of the helicopter. You just hoped you didn't fall out. Um, this was one of the clinics up in the mountains of Panama with uh, Guayme Indians. We had clinics. We would could do very little. Uh, there was no laboratory testing. We would um, give vitamins, uh, medevac out people who were dying. Uh, treat for parasites. Uh, the Guayme Indians had this habit of uh, filing their teeth, which they thought was very attractive. The men filed their teeth in a V and the women to a point. It did not help their problems with dental caries, I can guarantee you. Uh, when we went to the uh, mountains of Guatemala, <coughs> we were up in the Northwest in Neba, there was a war in um, Guatemala. We stayed at the Guatemalan military camp and then bussed out to the refugee camps where hundreds of people would line up to see us every day. Uh, they were in very poor condition. Many of them were malnourished and very poor. This was one of the Guatemalan rebels who had come down to the refugee camp. You can see that uh, they're malnourished and uh, have very little. This was a child we saw with uh, an eye infection. This girl had bilateral uh, um, infections of the eye and, and uh, Canada in her mouth. This young child was um, malnourished and we medevaced him down to Guatemala City, but he did not survive. This little girl had staph, mixed staph and scabies infections, which were rampant in the camp. I had the opportunity of getting scabies twice while I was there. Um, I was a pathologist. Uh, we had one pediatrician for um, 
general, uh, family practitioners and uh, a dermatologist in the group. So my services were not particularly helpful uh, in these clinics. We had one dentist, and generally 100 people every day needed to have teeth pulled. So the dentist, since I had been running the autopsy service, uh, decided that I could learn how to pull teeth, uh, which I did. Uh, and whenever I wasn't successful, then the dentist would carry on for me. <laughs> Several years after that, I uh, ended up, as a result of the uh, tropical medicine training in Panama, I mean in Indonesia, and uh, in a mine down here in Timica, which uh, is in Iria Jaya. It's now called Papua. Uh, it's the Indonesian half of that island. There is uh, a mine there called Gasberg Mine. They strip mine there. It's in uh, at 14,000 feet in a tropical glacier. They hire 16,000 miners, uh, and they have the largest gold reserves in the world. The 16,000 miners are generally unaccompanied. Uh, so they live in dorms by themselves. Their families cannot come. This is Tabagapura, which is the town that um, the mine built uh, for employees and their families. I was working down in the lowlands in Timica where there was a huge amount of malaria uh, but there was a huge, there were 600 sex workers that were uh, living and working <coughs> in uh, Temiko or outside of the town. Um, this is Nerlin Silatanga. She had graduated medical school. And in Indonesia, you have to work uh, for the government for two years if you want to practice medicine in the country. So Nerlin was doing her community service and uh, working for malaria control uh, at the mine down in Temica. So we decided that we would open a clinic for sex workers in the community hospital. This is the emergency room in that community hospital. As you can see, they had nothing. They had an oxygen tank, but that was pretty much it. Um, there was a building, a store building, behind the Puskas Mass. Um, that when we first got there, just had bags of uh, rice and mice uh, in there. We cleaned it out, um, turned it into a clinic. These men are the drivers uh, in, uh, for the mine, and that's one of the sex workers uh, behind there. Um, this was the first room in our uh, clinic. Uh, we take blood pressure. There were no OBGYNs in this town at the time. So not only did we see sex workers, but the women would come in for counseling and birth control. Um, and they called it the reproduction clinic so that there wouldn't be um, a stigma for the working women. This is Rima. She had been a uh, sex worker but became the nursing assistant in uh, our clinic. And Julia, who was the nurse practitioner who did the counseling and the treatment of the women who came to the clinic. The one, one of the things about 85% of the people in Indonesia are Muslim. They're moderate Muslims and they're very warm towards one another. And you can see that there's a very good feeling in this clinic uh, with the sex workers, some of the local uh, Papuans, and the uh, staff in the clinic. The laboratory had very little when we went there. The only laboratory test that they could do when I got there was um, smears for malaria. They had five uh, technicians that went around to the villages looking for six, sick people and they did 5,000, looked at 5,000 malaria uh, smears a month. There, there were no automated tests. There were no centrifuges. There were these um, refrigerators there. We were able to get a minus 60 freezer, 
a CO2 incubator. CO2 was brought in from Australia by the mine, by a cargo plane. Uh, we did not have a uh, hood, so we got the mine to make this plexiglass uh, shell that we could do most of our culture work in, and it worked actually pretty well. Because I had been a graduate student in microbiology, I knew how to make media. I would worked in the STD clinic downtown before there was HIV, and so I had learned quite a bit about identifying and uh, treating uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia. <clears throat> the half of the sex workers uh, lived in uh, Timica and worked there, and then half of them worked out in 10 uh, kilometers from the city, uh, which the city would certify because it was outside of the city. Why that was, I don't know. But um, this is the brothel. Uh, there were two lines of these houses with bars in the front and uh, rooms for the women in the back. Uh, the um, miners would come out by motorcycle and spend the night. Uh, the brothel owners realized that they had a problem with sexually transmitted diseases, and so they gave us this building. Uh, it had very little electricity, so we uh, set the microscope out, up outside so that we could use the sunlight in order to illuminate the scope. Uh, and the sex workers would uh, wait uh, on the porch uh, to go in. This was the examination room. This is uh, Julia um, counseling and treating one of the sex workers. We had a huge amount of support from Julie Schachter's lab and the staff in the lab. Eric is here. He helped me many, many times. Uh, Julie gave us uh, nucleic acid tests uh, so that we could take the swabs uh, over there and bring them back and have them tested in order to see what the real rate of infection was. Um, we were doing cultures and direct smears uh, locally, which was the best that we would be able to do uh, at, under the circumstances. You can see that um, for first visits of the sex workers, 30% of them had gonorrhea and almost 40% of them had chlamydia uh, by nucleic acid testing. Um, the women who were not sex workers that came to the clinic mostly for birth control, um, about 15% of them were infected. And the men that came, if, if you were a minor and went to the public health people uh, for the mine, and you had a sexually transmitted disease, you were fired. So the men would come to our clinic uh, to be tested in the hopes of uh, the mine not finding out, which of course it didn't. One of the unfortunate things that we learned was that 54% of the nucleic acid positive um, samples were culture negative. So we could only, at best, uh, find half of the infections. The other unfortunate thing we learned, uh, the CDC, Joe Knapp at the CDC did free uh, antimicrobial susceptibility testing for us at the clinic. We, when we started, we had zero ciprofloxacin resistance um, gonorrhea, which is what we were using to treat the gonorrhea. At five years, we had a 40% resistance. Uh, gonorrhea is a very difficult infection to control uh, with antibiotics because resistance comes up so quickly. After that, um, I ended up in Jakarta uh, working with USAID um, uh, on a project with HIV testing. Jakarta had no, uh, Indonesia, uh, their FDA had no standards for HIV test kits. 
And this is what you're going to see in a lot of these countries. Uh, Ed has been very fortunate to work with state-of-the-art equipment and testing, but I can tell you, <laughs> I'll give you a little story uh, about what happened. The, in Indonesia at the university, um, they had been uh, trying to, they knew they had a problem. They had been collecting some serum from a, uh, patients with AIDS so that they could get a repository and test uh, the test kits. People that are experienced in laboratory know that you don't take uh, people that are strongly positive for some test and use that as a standard. They also could not get very much uh, serum from these patients because they had AIDS and they were sick. I had, fortunately, had been running the blood bank at UCSF, and I said, uh, well, you know, not a problem. Let's just go to the blood bank. I'd met the uh, people at the Red Cross blood bank uh, years before because the embassy had asked me to go over and see what the situation was with uh, the blood bank. And so they very generously gave me, they were screening their blood for HIV, not confirming it. So they gave us pot, screen positive units and negative units. And then we, USAID, funded the Western blot testing, the freezers, and that sort of stuff. And we were able to develop a repository. And uh, we tested 15 EIA kits and 18 rapid tests that were being sold in the country. A uh, fair number of them were manufactured in the United States but couldn't be used here because they weren't uh, FDA approved in our country. Um, and what we found, surprisingly, was that no test performed better than the WHO uh, evaluation of test kits. They were not better. Uh, but some of these test kits were a lot worse and some of the kits had not been tested by the WHO. When we used single test, uh, when we looked at the panel with a single test, the uh, sensitivity ran from 49% to 99% and specificity 98 to 100. When we used the three test algorithm that the WHO says you can use if you don't have a Western blot, we found that we didn't have the same results that the WHO had. We, depending on the test sequence,